This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com, continuing our discussion concerning our Constitution of the United States. Does it square with the Bible, or is it contrary to the Bible? In our common law tradition, men make findings. And if you're a Christian man, if you believe the Bible, if you have a deep desire to do what God says, you will search out the scriptures. And you will search out the truth in nature because the scriptures give you the grand principles whereby you may govern your life, but the particular application is up to you. And you must decide moment by moment, you must find what God's will is. And it says in Hebrews chapter 5 that the The more you try to do that, the stronger you will get at it. By the way, that's called discernment. The application of general principles to specific instances of specific fact is called the power of discernment. And it is an authority, a jurisdiction, a right that you have been given individually to do that. And God does not want you to substitute a code or legislation of men in the place of his first principles, as I'd said before, codes and legislation of men seeks to be ever finer and ever more controlling of your future behavior. And to substitute that, which governments that enact legislation tend toward forcing men to do, it is their tool of domination. And to allow yourself to be dominated by such a thing to replace God's mind, the mind of Jesus Christ, Christ, as the Bible says, with some humanistic code, which is the code of the civil law, the Babylonian system most recently personified in the city of Rome and the Roman code. If you do that, you have allowed yourself to come into bondage. By the way, a comment about Rome. The book of Daniel presents four empires, and the last one is clearly Rome. The iron, the Roman legions, are indicative of that word iron that it refers refers to Rome, the Roman legions, Roman iron, the law of Rome mixed with humanity and the feet and legs of that image of which Daniel caught that vision from God. So Rome is used to show to the world today the final stage of the evil empire of Babylon with its system of religion, law, and government. And it mitigates at every point against the good government of God, so much so that it mixes with it as iron mixes with clay to where it's so thoroughly mixed, it's imperceptible. The two are, and we see that today. But Daniel goes on to point out very clearly that these substances, iron and clay, iron standing for the law and government and religion of Rome, and clay representing the race of Adam, Adam means clay, by the way, these never adhere because they cannot chemically bond. And that's as much as what he says in those verses in Daniel chapter 2. Simply put, there is no fellowship between the clay and the iron. The iron Iron just dominates the clay, but it makes a law and government that eventually crumbles apart because it never sufficiently dominates the people. So the law of God, though it is embedded in his creation, even Psalm 19 says the heavens, that is the creation of God up in the heavens, declare his glory. It does so. Like flashing neon lights all over the world saying God exists and this is who he is and this is what he does. But these words are, as it were, unwritten. And so it is with the common law. We call it and have for centuries the law unwritten because it is the law that we must find in every case and in every instance. And our common law is a law of specific instances. It is not a law of general application of a code to all humanity for the future, but rather it is a law of specific instances where we look in hindsight and declare what is right and what is wrong and the courts, specifically the jury, in the common law tradition is front and center, not legislation. In all other traditions of law, under the different labels, all Babylonian and all code type law, they are perspective. They look forward. But in our common law country, because our common law is a law of nature, we look backward before we look forward. We examine what happened and then we seek to find the specific application of the grand first principles that God has given. Then God has given us written revelation in the scriptures. And that revelation is a little more specific, but it's first principle still, and it doesn't tell us everything. Well, our Constitution of the United States is not drawn, as some people say, directly out of the Ten Commandments. Not at all. And it is not even drawn out of the Bible. And one of the reasons for that is it is not an instrument to govern the people of the United States. 
Far from it. It is an instrument meant to govern and limit government, specifically the general government that was then established, and not the state governments. And I know it's been turned around and forced to do that, and that's another matter. We'll get to that in Article 5. We might touch on it. Then when we get to Amendment 14, then we can talk about it more particularly, but we've got plenty to talk about before then. Well, my mind is overflowing with things to say, and the subject is swelling into my hands to the point that it is about to get out of control and my mouth is being crowded with words so I'm going to back up and read a bit of our constitution and talk about it for just a moment to keep me on track. It says in article 1 section 3 clause 7 that judgment in cases of impeachment and remember the house of representatives impeaches impeach means to catch by the foot it is analogous to a grand jury indictment it holds a fellow over for trial and then the senate of the United States tries all impeachments. So we're talking here about impeachment, just as a trial court would try an indictment. Judgment in cases of impeachment, we're talking about the Senate when it talks about judgment. Judgment is not the process, it is the end of the process, the conclusion. And this judgment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. Now notice very clearly here that impeachment and trial for impeachment does not grant to the Congress of the United States in those two things, does not grant criminal jurisdiction. That is, the Congress of the United States cannot do anything but remove a man from office. They cannot pronounce a sentence of punishment in any form other than just removal from office and then attaches by operation of this clause a forbidding to hold any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. Well, that doesn't mean that he cannot become a governor of a state, a treasurer of a state, a secretary of state of a state. That does not mean he can't be appointed the judge of a state. This applies only to federal offices of of trust or profit. And then it says that doesn't mean also just because we remove a man from office by means of our Congress that he is not liable for any other criminal prosecutions. Well, that stands to reason. And if he's removed for a felony, he's open to prosecution by the federal government or the state government, but not by the Congress of the United States. Prosecution, remember, would come through the other two branches of government. The executive branch would prosecute and the judicial branch would conduct the trial. And then this phrase is added on the end that is of utmost general application to our Constitution and and importance. And that is the phrase, the last three words at the very end of section 3, clause 7, article 1, according to law. There is a bit of a limitation here to the prosecution and sentencing of any person impeached by the Congress of the United States or the House of Representatives and then convicted. It says this, any indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment must be according to law. And don't let this escape you. I hope you can remember this. Law just the word law in our common law tradition means common law. And common law, of course, at the center of that is due process. The phrase according to law means according to the course of our common law, as also our Northwest Ordinance of 1787 says with those very words, according to the course of the common law, which is another phrase meaning due process. To try to draw an analogy, these phrases and words mean different things in our common law tradition. Sometimes different phrases or words mean the same thing. Watch me close. Our common law appears to be rather messy compared to the civil law, the city law of the rest of the world. To put it in the antagonistic terms that draw the contrast, our law of the land is messy in the eyes of those who live in countries where the law of the city rules. The law of the city, called the civil law, sometimes called the Roman civil law, governs all the continent of Europe, all of South America, most every country in the world. In the countries of Asia, all the communist blocs are under some form of the Roman Code. The hallmark of the Roman Code is absolute precision. And the men that have promulgated that code in its different forms, the first man to really make it precise and try to draw it all together was Justinian, the Roman emperor from Constantinople. And he said that his code, he was going to make it so precise as he gathered all the Roman law into one pot. 
make it so precise that judges would no longer be needed. Well, if you haven't noticed, in order to do something like that, you must claim that you, as a legislator, whether it's you or a bevy of men, such as a Congress or a legislature, to say that no judges are needed because the code, the legislation, is so precise, is to say that you have gathered the judicial powers in your hand. You are not only the lawgiver, the lawmaker, you are also the one who judges the law in specific instances. Well, that is the policy of the Roman Code. It is the gathering of all three powers of government into a single will. Nothing could be more dangerous, and as has been observed by Americans since the beginning, to do so is the very definition of tyranny. Our Constitution goes to great pains to not do that. As a matter of fact, beyond our Constitution, the buildings that were built in Washington, D.C. to house, number one, the legislature of the United States, called a Congress, and the executive power in what came to be called the White House under the administration of President Andrew Jackson. Before that, it was called the Executive Mansion. It was put far away from the Congressional buildings, exactly one mile, if I'm not mistaken, for symbolic reasons to show the separation of those two powers. Later on, within my own lifetime, even during the Vietnam War, the Supreme Court justices, one of them got so upset about them befriending people in the executive branch, he refused to attend any functions at the White House. It has come to me now, I couldn't remember right offhand, that was Justice Harlan. Justice Harlan went so far, Justice Harlan of the United States Supreme Court, he refused, out of conviction of the separation of powers, he refused to vote in any presidential election, by the way, any other elections, and never applauded the president's State of the Union address. He attended, but he refused to show any emotion one way or the other, or support. Justice Harlan persuaded the others, his brethren on the bench, as they used to be called, persuaded them to abandon the practice of calling on the president of the United States, lest President Johnson try to use them to legitimize his war effort as well. He simply would not go to the White House for any reason. By contrast to our common law, under the city law in those countries, such as Germany, France, and all the countries of South America, the judge is a part of the civil service ranks. He's a part of the executive branch. He's a glorified bureaucrat. He is educated not to be a lawyer, but to be a judge and he will never be a lawyer. Thus his judgment in no way can be said to be independent. In fact, he is beholden to the executive power of the government for his paycheck and even for his job. And if he does not support the executive power, which is also compounded with the legislative power, he's gone. His service, says Merriman, is a bureaucratic career. He is a mere functionary, a civil servant. A judicial function of such a man is narrow, mechanical, and uncreative. Bottom line, he has not the power power of discernment. What is that? That's the power to find the law. He's not supposed to find the law. The law has been provided for him in every specific instance they believe that could be imagined. These concepts are creeping into our common law government in two ways. Number one, our judges are increasingly bureaucratic. Number two, they're not even lawyers anymore. We have people sitting on the benches of our federal courts now who have never practiced law, but I have noticed also on the benches of our state courts. It is an increasing problem. Supreme Court Chief Justice Roberts said in his report, an annual report in 2006, that there's been a shift from where we get our judges for the benches in this country. During the Eisenhower administration, most judges came from private practice. And by the way, private practice is a rough and tumble place to be for a lawyer. As a matter of fact, it can be downright dangerous. And the minority of people sitting on the bench from the Supreme Court right on down were former government employees, prosecutors, bureaucrats of several kinds. Today, says Chief Justice Roberts in 2006, that has flipped. Now the majority of people sitting on the benches in our states united from the federal Supreme Court right on down are government employees. And he adds this, that is not the place from where we have traditionally sought judges to defend our rights. And don't forget when we say rights in our common law country, we mean responsibilities. Rights are stewardship delegated to men from God, not from men, from God. By the way, directly, not indirectly, not through some man. And if we do not have courts with judges that have an understanding, that have practiced law, that aren't purely academians, the common law, by the way, isn't known by academians. That's the city law, the scholar, the scholastic. This is Brent Allen Winters, commonlawyer.com. 
Please stay with us and we'll be right back after this short break on Liberty Works Radio Network. Work. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. Thanks for joining us for the second part of this hour. We left off in the last segment saying that it is not precisely correct to say that a right always has a corresponding responsibility. No, a right is a responsibility. The meaning of that word has been hijacked in modern times and fosters terrible confusion, most devastatingly, on the benches of our courts and in our jury boxes. They do not understand rights. That means they do not understand the responsibilities that God has given men and the necessity that men have to fulfill those responsibilities. And by the way, for that reason, that's why scriptures do not in any way or nature allow prisons Prisons are part of the evil empire, and they take away man's liberty, which is a responsibility. It is a right to fulfill a stewardship that God has given him. And that stewardship is so sacred, so important, that God does not sanction the idea of locking men in cages. And when they're put there, all sorts of nasty things are done to them. Many of them are drugged just to make the lives of the bureaucrats easier, just as children are drugged when they're taken into institutions such as schools today in order to make it easier for the administrator. Everything in the city law system is bent toward ease of administration of state policy and commands. Our Constitution is not so. Our Constitution is wholly driven toward limiting government, not governing people. Hear me well on that. The center policy of our Constitution is not to govern the people of the United States. It is to govern the people in government. Well, back to that phrase at the end of Section 3, Clause 7, according to law. That phrase attaches by necessity to Article 6, the Supreme Law of the Land. And I want to start where we left off last time talking about the Supreme Law of the Land. And specifically, that phrase, Law of the Land, the word supreme being a comparative modifier, referring not to the superlative, but to the comparative idea that the law of the federal government trumps laws of states where, this is important qualification, where those laws are contrary to the laws of the federal government, the general government, as our forefathers called it. Contrary is an important word, too. It doesn't mean offensive. It doesn't even really mean repugnant. Contrary means contrary. That means To obey the one is to disobey the other. An example of that that is so famous is found in Acts where Peter says, You tell us, members of the Supreme Court, are we to obey you or obey God? And the reason he said that was because to obey them would have constituted immediate disobedience to God. If you can obey both at the same time, that's not contrary. It may be offensive. It may even appear inconsistent, but it is not contrary. And it is for that reason that Jesus Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount, When a Roman soldier asks you to carry his pack a mile, and that was Roman law, if the Roman soldier asked you to help him tote something for a mile, the law said you had to. He said, do it. Not only should you do that, go ahead and carry it too if you want. But the point there was the Roman law did not keep God's man from obeying God. It was something he could do and obey God too. The same thing is true of the laws of our Constitution passed pursuant to it, duly passed according to due process. If you you can obey those and obey the laws of your state, then that's what should be done. Disobedience to the statutes of the legislature duly passed is not to be taken lightly, and that test should be applied. But let's talk about that phrase, law of the land, as in Article 6, as it compares to the words here, law, or according to law, due process. Now, a clear definition of the law of the land is so important, and I've repeated it so much, after making these presentations orally, I was motivated to include an appendix explaining that phrase in the Common Lawyer Study Bible. That way I can just refer to that and not have to repeat these things each time. It comes up often in the Bible, too. It's an important consideration. Remember, our common law is the nexus. Listen to me. Our common law is the nexus that enables the law of God to be implemented. It is the law of nature. The Constitution of the United States is a restatement applied to us Americans of the law of nature, the unwritten law of nature that God has put in his creation, telling us how our government is to be limited. This Constitution of the United States 
is the result of centuries of bloodshed and struggle and experience that has taught men, our forebears, our ancestors, the ones who have gone before us, how to implement, make practical, make real in our lives the law of God. And if there's anything in our Constitution that is contrary to the law of God, and I'm personally convinced there are some things that are, and we'll get to those. And where that is true, that is not part of the common law because it's not part of the law of nature. It's an interloping provision where discernment wasn't taken aright. Remember, our common law is man's struggle to apply the standards of God, the first principles of the Bible, to his life moment by moment and day by day. And when you apply the principles of the Bible to your life, you seek to apply your experience and the experiences of others to the specific application to guide you. In applying the principles of God. Just as a child learns not to touch a hot skillet handle by experience, just as a cat will never set on a hot stove lid twice, just as a hog, when he's rooting, will learn to be careful not to let his ears touch the electric fence. Through all those experiences, they apply the laws of nature's God. And those laws of nature's God found in nature, found in electricity, found in the heat of fire on the stove that is conducted and transferred to iron in an iron skillet. Those laws are wholly consistent at every point with the written word of God, just as the movements of the heavens and the bodies of the heavens are wholly consistent with the written word of God. The oldest creed known to mankind in writing is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. It translates into English, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Echad, that that doesn't mean first. That doesn't mean first. That means unity. God is unified. That means everything he says in his law and his standards, every manifestation of his person to us through nature and through creation, all of that is a chad. It is consistent with itself and it increasingly becomes more apparent to the man that accepts that consistency and that reliability of his law and his law above all things, whether in nature, unwritten, whether in our written Bibles or whether in that part of our natural law we call the common law. It is always consistent and it is up to us to find the specific application in specific cases and without the common law that would not happen. So I say the common law is the nexus tying the written word of God through nature, through our experience, to our own lives, makes it real, allows us as men to apply that law moment by moment in our own lives and even through our courts in ways that bring that ultimate order of God, the tranquility of the preamble of the Constitution, the peace of our country and the peace that each of us God has given and to thwart all violations of that peace. Well, I didn't get to the law of the land, its meaning, but you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to start right in on that next time. And we'll say it again, go through it. When we get to Article 6, we'll go through it again, Lord willing. But I'm anxious to make a clear presentation of that. And in so doing, it will give us an overarching principle whereby to govern our understanding of this common law writing, this writ called our Constitution of the United States. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com, and this is part 18 in our series, The Constitution of the United States versus the Bible. Is our Constitution of the Kingdom of God, or is it of the Kingdom of Evil, the Evil Empire? Well, we've said and before, and we need to say again, our Constitution is an expression of the discernment of men discerning the law of God in the laws of nature. The laws of nature are those laws written in God's creation. And by the way, we, as mankind, are part of that creation. We are made, in fact, of clay, dirt. Adama, it says in the Old Testament Hebrew text, God made man out of Adama and called his name Adam, Adam. And then he said, take dominion over the earth. And as my good friend out west sometimes tells me, to take dominion over the earth means foremost and first that man take dominion over himself because he is made of clay, that is, earth. And in man, in the experience of man, 
He discovers through discernment the laws of nature and of nature's God. John Locke, Puritan in training, recognized to be the source of our Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson having lifted language out of John Locke's second treatise on government to write much of our Declaration. John Locke said this, The Eternal Father of light and fountain of all knowledge communicates to mankind that portion of truth which he has laid within the reach of their natural faculty. Locke goes on to say that if man will but feel a little and look, he will find those first principles of government and law that God has set forth by his creation, specifically in the creation of man as man interacts with other men, created beings, and with his environment around him, with creation itself. And to do that is the basis of all what we call scientific investigation and discovery. We discover the laws of nature and we discover how they work. Our Constitution is an expression of what men have discovered, not only by their experience, but by the experience of others as they look into history. As the scriptures say of history that it has recorded, these things are written for our learning. And never forget, that ability to learn from the experience of others is what distinguishes you and me from the brute beasts that God has created. Indeed, man learns by experience. But he can do something that a cat cannot do. And as we pointed out in the previous presentation, a cat will never sit on a hot stove lid twice. But the cat has not the ability to learn that truth by watching the experience of another cat. He is a beast. He can only learn that truth from his own experience. But mankind, quite another matter. We can learn from the experience of others our own experience, and watching what happens to other people. And I am confident that if you think about that, you'll think of a lot of times you've learned things from watching other people, what is painful and what is not, and what brings good feeling and what does not. And beyond that, the scriptures tell us to observe the animals, to learn from what they do and their experiences. The laws of nature are drawn from creation, and creation is the mountain from which blocks of facts are hewn, and facts are the foundation stones upon which the frame of reason sits, and reason is the tool revealing how law applies to the government of the lives of individuals, whether it be a government exerted by himself or by another, whose authority one falls under. Now let's talk about that phrase in Article 6 of our Constitution that is so important to understanding the entire Constitution because the common law informs every word and phrase in our Constitution, giving it meaning. It is the law of nature, and the law of nature is the law of nature's God. And that is the phrase, law of the land. And I'd said last time, or time before last, now I'm getting behind. British Chief Justice John Finuke, in the year 1519, said this, The law of God and the law of the land are all one. And Henry Black followed up on that statement in 1910. He's a lexographer of legal words. That means he explains what they mean, where they come from. He said this, The law of God and the law of the land are all one, and both preserve and favor the common law and and public good of the land. The words law of the land form a term of common law significance within which is bound holy writs requirement for men respecting government and means at bottom common law due process. Law of the land means common law due process, the fair play due to all parties of interest in any given matter. And though its meaning at common law and government predates Magna Carta by centuries, Stephen Langton's drafting these Latin words lex terra into Magna Carta thereby established and published this fundamental ancient first principle of our common law to the world. Because Latin was the international language of the day. It was the language of all of the courts of Europe. It certainly was the language of Rome, and Langton intended that the Pope read it. Well, Stephen Langton was excommunicated for his efforts, and the Pope of Rome immediately said that all that were involved with signing of Magna Carta, whether it be the drafters or the supporters, were in rebellion against him, and he denounced them all. Back in those days, men understood that the common law of England and the civil law of the continent, at that time the power center of the civil law was Rome, were antagonistic, indeed were at war. 
and the control of all of Europe depended upon the city law being extended throughout its territories. England was the place where that was nearly impossible. The common law had been destroyed in the north of Europe by the infiltration of the civil law of Rome, first through the emperors, who had a little success but ultimately failed, and then through the combined powers, the Holy Roman Empire, the church and the state, and then finally the church, which was a state itself, infiltrated all of Europe and attempted to do the same thing in England and established the Pope's one-man rule there also. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. Please stay with us and we'll be right back after this short break for the final segment of this hour on Liberty Works Radio Network. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. Welcome back to the final segment of this hour coming to you from the heart of the Wabash Valley. The phrase law of the land bespeaks due process, and Langton put it in the Latin words he uses to draft Magna Carta, Lex Terra, in the accusative case, which means this law and no other, this law and no more. Just as the story of the entire Bible is the story of the struggle between the kingdom, that is, the law and government of God's earth and land, and the empire, that is, the law and government of man's city, the law of the land versus the law of the city, The most important and oft-appearing Old Testament Hebrew word respecting government is the word mishpat, and this word means process. It denotes procedure, and when used of God's law and government, it means due process. The process that is due and owing in every instance to all parties whose lives or property are affected by the decision in any given matter. It is a word that denotes the means and not the ends of government. It denotes the channel the courses that are to be taken without regard to the result. Indeed, in the city government of Babylon, the ends justifies the means, whereas at common law, because of due process, the means is all important, and that is what justifies the ends. This first principle of God's government is clearly consistent throughout Scripture and throughout nature, and thus throughout our common law tradition. This word, this Hebrew word in the Older Testament, mishpat, is often used, it occurs, at my account, presently anyway, 368 times. The King James translators translate rightly this word and render it as follows. According to the manner, manner of law, after the manner, the manner of, according to, manner, according to the order, after the due order, according to the form, according to the order of, to order a cause, right, according to the custom, the right of, due process, the words due process are not used, but according to the right of is used, the paths of judgment. I like that. That one paths the disposing the right discretion worthy in measure of worthy of that is as in duly established lawful that which is lawful according to their fashions justly precedeth no not precedeth proceedeth as in process determination burdens and the word burdens is used that which is due as is due process that's an interesting use of the word there well they're all interesting who am I kidding but that last one burdens is used of the burdens of Issachar, which the King James says is an ass, as in a jackass, a donkey, crouching down between two burdens. Because of, and in light of, all of these renderings of the word mishpat, which indicate not a result, but a channel, a course, a process, Jesus Christ says, I am the way. Remember, in the Old Testament, the word is translated path. and the Newer Testament is a use of the Greek language language to try to approximate the Old Testament Hebrew. All of the New Testament words used to communicate these concepts of law and government, which, by the way, is the overarching theme of the Bible, all of these Greek words must be seen in light of the Hebrew words that the writer or speaker of the New Testament is attempting to approximate, that is, communicate. Well, thus, all that taken into consideration, the Old Testament word, mishpat, signifies the lawful means, the lawful path, the lawful course channel or way a man, government, or jury is to follow in reaching conclusions respecting any particular application of the law to a particular person in a particular instance under particular facts. It denotes the discernment that is used to choose the right channel
fall within the course of the law that allows the process that is due that achieves, now watch this, fair play. The word fair play at common law is a word of due process. And the whole concept and idea of the word fair play arise from the common law culture. The process is expressed in many ways and it's different according to the law to be applied to what relationship. By the way, our common law, as is the scriptures, is a law of meant foremost to protect relationships. At the city law, the law of Babylon, the chief overarching purpose is to effect the will of the state as expressed in legislation. Therefore, it is a system of religion, law, and government meant to reach a certain result regardless of the way, the course, or the means. For this reason, our Northwest Ordinance of 1787 says that trial by jury is guaranteed, and by the way, the jury, the common law jury, is a wholly biblical idea. We'll get to that when we get to the Article 7 and Amendment 6, but the Bible certainly isn't silent on the subject of the jury, although the right the righteousness of the jury has been buried in unrighteousness, and even the passages that teach us to impanel the jury are used to say that we are never to impanel a jury. Indeed, never go to court. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Consider, for example, one important process of the common law, and our Constitution of the United States is an expression of common law. And that is this, that facts come before law. Facts come before law. In the system of Babylon, called the city law, the code, the expression of the will of the state comes first. And all things must focus on that. Facts tend to recede from any procedure in a civil law country, because the law is the code. The will of the state must be achieved at all costs, regardless of the facts. No, when we go to trial in America, the facts come first. What are the facts? The law really, in the final analysis, in jury trial, which is the heart of our common law, the law doesn't matter. Indeed, the jury doesn't think about it, not compared to their thinking about the facts. Once they know the facts, the law takes care of itself. They think they know right and wrong, and they probably do, regardless of what any legislator says or any legislature. Everywhere in the Bible, men, by the law of God, are told not to just do what they want and let it go. They can do a lot of things. They can maintain order in doing it if they will but do what God wants them to do. For example, God hates divorce, but he recognizes it's going to happen. And in order to bring some measure of order to the madness, he says, if you do divorce your wife, give her a bill of divorcement. Do the paperwork. Otherwise, she has no evidence. Provide her evidence that she's not married. That frees her to do other things. It is the process that is focused upon. In sum, the words law of the land embrace two indispensable foundation first principles of our common law. First, it insists that men focus focus on following a certain process and not focus on achieving a certain result. Let the result fall where it may. Follow the process. Matter of fact, Jesus says in Matthew 18, if you will but follow this process, when you have a problem with your brother, the process he lays down there, then whatever is bound in earth shall be bound in heaven. In other words, God will enforce the result and bless it. Our responsibility is not the result. Our responsibility as men in this day of man's administration of government is process. And at common law, we call that due process, because we not only owe it to God, we owe it to everybody involved. And this brings up another important point. Those that want to do away with the Constitution and say we should operate purely on the law of God as it is written in the Bible, well, I think we should do all we can to follow the law of God as it's written in the Bible, but God has given us nature and experience, and that's what the common law is. It enables us to find the specific application of those laws of God. But note this, and this is ignored by those that promote the idea idea that the Constitution is not biblical. The law of God, written as it is written in the Bible, gives to no recognizable government as such any mechanisms of enforcement. None. There are no enforcement mechanisms. Obviously, sacrifices are voluntary. And also, in cases of theft and what we in America have come to call felonies, there is no enforcement device except the accusers, that is the witnesses to the crime, if it's a capital crime, are to be the first to initiate the execution by throwing the first stone, as Jesus so well affirms the law of God in Matthew chapter 8. I take that back. hope somebody caught that. It was John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. Even the kings, which 
were against the law of God in the Old Testament that tried to approximate the law of God, even though they didn't do that right by even taking up the kingship, they are lauded where they did the right thing, attempting to do as much to follow the law of God as possible. Our common law provides the executive power, which is an enforcement power, that the law written in the writings of Moses does not include. Except to say this, and I don't want to ignore it, there is an enforcement power in the law of God, in the writings of Moses, an enforcement power against those who claim power. And that's why Moses said in the middle of the book of Numbers, praying to God out of desperation, and asking God, indeed in this reminding God, that there were at that time the militia of the twelve several tribes, over 600,000 footmen. And he tells God, you don't understand the situation I'm in. These men are ready to enforce what they believe is the law of God. There's one of me and 600,000 of them. Clearly, Moses feared the militia of the 12 several tribes of Israel. And that's what God intended. So there is that enforcement mechanism. And if the militia of the 50 several states of the United States were doing their constitutional duty, the police state wouldn't stand a prayer in America. And our enemies would be afraid of us also, much more afraid than they are now. And there are four militia clauses that lay out those responsibilities in surprising detail. In fact, not since the days of Israel of old has any country had such a forthright fundamental law concerning the responsibilities of the militia, in this case the militia of the several states, and the responsibilities of the state and general government in providing, according to the Constitution, legislation to make that militia more effective than it already is. Now those Americans that have taken up their duty under the militia clauses, the last one being the Second Amendment, the last of the four, have done what they can do. Then it's up to the state legislators after that, along with the governor, to sign legislation and see to it at the local level that officers of the militia are appointed. Back to the meaning of the phrase law of the land. Magna Carta's most famous clause is called the law of the land clause. It says this, no freeman shall be taken or imprisoned or be deceased of his freehold, that means removed and removed his ownership, or liberties, or free customs, or be outlawed, or exiled, or any other wise destroyed, nor will we not pass upon him, nor condemn him, but by lawful judgment of his peers, or, and here's the phrase, by the law of the land. That means by common law due process. Almost 600 years later, following the American colonies' withdrawal from Britain's empire, legislators of these colonies turned states, relying on Edward Coke's commentaries on Magna Carta, affirmed Magna Carta's law of the land clause by their organic law. Virginia, New York, South Carolina, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Congress's Northwest Ordinance all distinguish the law of the land, that is, the means, or the due process, from the judgment of peers, that is, the conclusion, as did Magna Carta. Now, I'm going to go briefly through these organic laws of these separate states and read them to you and try to see if you can see the distinction. The Virginia Constitution of 1776, Section 8, says this, No man be deprived of his liberty except by the law of the land or the judgment of his peers. Those two phrases are lifted straight out of Magna Carta. And the law of the land speaks of the process, due process, and the judgment of his peers speaks of the conclusion, the result, the jury verdict in this case. This is the New York Constitution of 1777, section 13. It says as follows, And this convention doth further in name and by the authority of the good people of this state ordain, determine, and declare that no member of this state shall be disfranchised or deprived of any the rights or privileges secured to the subjects of this state by this constitution, unless by the law of the land or the judgment of his peers. Again, the law of the land is the process that is due and the judgment of his peers is the conclusion. That tells us then the means and the ends. South Carolina Constitution of 1778 says this, no freeman of this state shall be taken, imprisoned, or deceased of his freehold. Deceased means removed from, ownership being removed from. Properties, liberties, privileges, none of these may be outlawed. He may not be exiled or in any manner destroyed or deprived of his life, his liberty, or his property, but by the judgment of his peers or by the law of the land, by due process and judgment of his peers, by the conclusion and verdict of the jury. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com, and thanks for joining us this hour. You can obtain my books at Amazon.com, just type in the name Brent Allen Winters, 
and you'll find there my comparative law book comparing and contrasting the two grand great traditions of law and government that cover the globe, the city law and the law of the land, the law of the city and the law of the land. The name of the book is Excellence of the Common Law, tracing the history of our common law tradition and the civil law, the city law tradition, going back as far as Babylon and bringing it up to the present, contrasting the difference between two traditions by their first principles, and also a great satisfaction to me after a few decades of labor is my Common Lawyer Study Bible. To obtain the Common Lawyer Study Bible, go to www.commonlawyer.com, go to the resources page, and on the right at the top you'll see there where you can click on the Common Lawyer Study Bible and follow the directions to obtain a copy. The King James Bible, with over 10,000 footnotes throughout its 66 books, detailed head notes, introducing each book of the Bible, 40 appendices, all aimed at showing the agreement of God's law, God's will, the revelation of His will, which is His law, written in the Bible, and our common law, unwritten. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com, and I look forward to you joining us again Monday here on Liberty Works Radio Network.